So now we really want to take a look at how we can assess left ventricular function at the bedside. Okay, now normally there are a few ways we can do it, but ejection fraction, so left ventricular ejection fraction tends to be a surrogate marker for ventricular function, meaning that if it's depressed, it can actually suggest certain things. Okay, so if a, maybe a patient comes in and you look at a prior echo and it shows a normal EF, ejection fraction, and then you take a look at the bedside echo and it looks like, oh, this may be dropped, okay? There may be evidence of ischemia or something else that's contributing to that. So let's see which views we can use to assess left ventricular function. Okay, and I've put them up here. You can see the parasternal long axis view, the parasternal short axis view, apical four chamber view, in the subcostal four chamber view okay all of these views we've looked at in the past so if you haven't gone through those videos you can go back and look at them in detail where we look at the structures we can see in each now visual estimation of left ventricular function you know often by ejection fraction is actually an accurate and somewhat reliable for most clinical purposes especially in the acute setting you know are we uh, looking for an acute drop in lv function and how we do this is by assessing wall th thickening and motion. We'll look at in another lecture, left ventricular hypertrophy, okay? But in this one, I want you to compare the left ventricular size, both in systole and diastole, okay? So we'll look at that here. So let's look at these views. So notice that we have the parasternal long axis view, which is this one here. And in this one, we can look at the left ventricle, which is this portion here. Okay, and then we have the apical four chamber view, and here we have our left ventricle cavity. Okay, and then we have our subcostal uh, four chamber view as well. Okay, and in the subcostal four chamber view, you can see our left ventricle here. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now the view I want to focus on where we'll look at, you know, how do we assess between mild and moderate, severe, and even hyperdynamic LV function. Okay, so first we always want to look at normal. And the views that we're going to look at from now on in the next uh, few at, towards the end of this lecture will be in this parasternal short axis view. We'll specifically look at the level at the papillary muscle. So the papillary muscle view, parasternal short axis view, okay? So everything else we look at is in this view. And this will be helpful because we'll be able to see what is actually normal in this view and what is abnormal, okay? We're always comparing um, the diastole and the systole, okay? So let's look at what's normal. So normal LV function is this one here. So this would be normal. Okay, I've highlighted here, so normal. And notice that this is our LV cavity in diastole. So this is diastole here, and this is your LV cavity there. Okay, and notice that during the diastole it's open. Okay, so the left ventricle fills up with blood, and in systole when it's squeezing, it collapses. And notice the cavity then get smaller. So that's normal, okay? The LV wall thickens and moves more centrally towards the center of the left ventricle as it pumps blood out, okay? So that's what we normally expect. So from the bigger to the smaller. So let's look at what we see in mild to moderate LV dysfunction. So if you look up to the upper right, you can see that here. So this is mild to moderate LV dysfunction. And again, we're looking at diastole and systole. And what we're looking for here is that there's actually a moderate change in the LV wall thickening and mild to moderate change in the chamber size. So what do I mean by that? So again, notice that we have our chamber. This is our left ventricle. Again, we are in our parasternal short axis view. So this is, all of these are the parasternal short axis view. And this is at the papillary muscle level, okay? And so we have that in diastole. And notice in systole, okay, what you have is just a little bit of change, okay, so it does collapse a little bit, but notice it not as much when you compare it to the one over here, okay, in the normal. So notice that that's what we consider mild to moderate LV dysfunction, and it's really eyeballing it, okay? And it takes a lot of practice to be able to identify that. So make sure not only looking at these images, but going back and doing it yourself at the bedside, okay? Whether on a friend or even on a patient. 
So there's a moderate uh, change in the LV wall thickening of it, okay, uh, as well as the mild to moderate change in the chamber size. So there is some, okay. Uh, now what happens with severe LV dysfunction? Okay, so that's the next one. This is severe, again, looking diastole and systole. And this is where we have minimal change in the LV wall thickening, in this case here, um, and in the chamber size. So what do we mean by that? So notice here's your left ventricle cavity, okay, and that's in diastole, and notice it in systole, okay? It's almost the same. So that is what we consider severe LV dysfunction, meaning that the heart is just not able to pump that blood, and it's just uh, sitting in there, and the cavity remains enlarged, okay, similar to that in diastole. So hopefully that makes sense. So notice as we go from the normal, okay, the cavity size in the normal, notice as we go to mild to moderate the cavity size, okay, uh, a little bigger. And then in systole, going from diastole to systole uh, in severe LV dysfunction, it remains almost the same as that in diastole, okay? So if they look the same, then diastole and systole, then you probably have more LV dysfunction. Now there's one last thing I want to mention, and this is hyperdynamic LV function, okay? And this is where you have left ventricular wall thickening, and the motion of the left ventricle pretty much obliterates the chamber in systole, okay? So notice this here. You have the, again, diastole and systole, and notice in diastole you have your chamber here, okay? Already a little small, but you can see it, but notice that cavity here, okay? It's this portion in here, and it's that. So notice how small it is. I'll erase that so you can see it again. But look at that. Look at the difference in the sizes, okay? So it pretty much collapses, and you can't even see almost any of the chamber uh, during systole. So notice, check out this here and compare it to that over in the normal, okay? So even more collapse, okay? So this is what we call hyperdynamic LV function, and this can be in the setting of a stress, so an infection or something else that may be causing the heart to work harder and it's just uh, beating maybe too fast or just uh, collapsing very significantly. So those are the different views of LV function in the peristernal short axis view at the papillary muscle level. So let's just review what we discussed before we end here. So assessing LV function, some of the ones you can look at these views are the peristernal long axis view, the short axis view, apical four chamber view, uh, as well as the subcostal four chamber view. We looked at these views here. Here's the long axis, the apical four chamber, and the subcostal four chamber. You can use the same methods we discussed in the rest, where we looked at the parasternal, to use that to assess LV function, okay? Meaning you're looking at the collapse. You're comparing the left ventricular size in both systole and diastole. If it changes from in diastole to systole, we saw what normal was, okay? And if you compare normal, I'll erase that so you can see that normal size. So notice that size change. And then we look at it in when there's mild to moderate LV dysfunction. Notice the difference, okay? So it collapses only a little more. Um, with severe LV dysfunction, notice that the diastole is nearly the same, the chamber size in systole, okay? Meaning that the squeeze of the left ventricle is not as good. And then when we looked at the hyperdynamic, this is almost beyond the normal function, right? We saw the normal that went from this chamber size to here. Here we have it going from the normal to even smaller, okay? So the left ventricle is squeezing even more, obliterating that chamber in systole, okay? So that's hyperdynamic LV function. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, this is practice going through and looking at a lot of these images, practicing at the bedside on the patients and making sure you're able to get that visually. Okay, so this is a visual estimation of LV function, different from when we do just the transthoracic or transesophageal echo where we have more time. This is the bedside point of care ultrasound where you're assessing in the acute setting or maybe on rounds. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available. So again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md. Okay, so this is our website. 
And what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos, and this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference. Okay, this was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there. Very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic, in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So Go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay. You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.